I can't stop this bill. No. No, 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 I have two guys. I have not seen him in two weeks. I didn't, I hadn't heard him. I mean, I should have already talked but I didn't think about it. I'm going to be sick. I'll have to check on it. Okay. All right. You will. Yeah, I'll we'll do that. How's everybody this morning? Wonderful. You're doing great. Good. Good. How are you? I'm well. It's funny how uh, sometimes God uh, introduces a subject. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's amazing how He's introduced a subject to this church today that is uh, is being preached and taught throughout the whole entire time of Sunday school and the sermon. Morning. And um, I don't know, there's somebody in here today that needs to hear what's being said, okay? I, I, I know that from the bottom of my heart, there's no doubt about it, but there's one person, at least one person, that needs to hear what God's got to say to them. And uh, I don't know who that person is. I have no idea. But uh, I, I pray that you listen. Whoever you are, whoever you are, I pray that you listen. We're going to be talking about an individual today. And uh, the guy's name is Eddie Shepherd. Say that back to me. Eddie Shepherd? Eddie Shepherd. Eddie Shepherd has a son named Shane. Say Shane. Shane. All right. So what's Eddie's name? Eddie Shepherd. What's, what's Shane's name? Shane Shepherd. Yeah. How many kids does Eddie have? One. We don't know. I see he has a son named Shane. He also had four. But we're not, but we're not going to talk about them today. We're not talking about them today. Let me tell you a little story about Eddie Shepard. <clears throat> and this comes from something that Becky and I actually both witnessed this week. This week. It happened to me and Becky this week. Eddie Shepard was a, is a very devout Christian man. He is a person that is uh, outstanding in his community. He has a loving wife. He has the, what you would consider, not, so, not, not necessarily a perfect Christian home, but he has dang very close to it as far as relationship with his wife is concerned. He has five boys. One, one of them named Shane. And I want to tell you a little bit about what happened not long ago. Being a devout Christian, being a man of high integrity, of good character, Eddie loves his children. He don't mind showing that he loves his children. But for whatever reason, God blessed Eddie with five boys and only one that would allow Eddie to love him. Four of the boys are, let's just say, not what you want your daughter to want out. Not who you want coming and sitting at your dinner table. And definitely not do what you would want borrowing something from your shed. Because no telling what would happen to the daughter, and there'd be a lot of tools missing the time they got through. These four brothers stay in trouble all the time. These four brothers are known for drinking, drunkenness, women, drugs, thievery, blackmail. Conspiracy, trouble, awful. But I want to talk about shame. It is a devout man. And even though he loves his four kids, he can't help but love shame the most. Because shame is the picture perfect son. He is a son that when dad gets up on Saturday morning, and all the other boys hit the road and you won't see them from midnight that night. Shane's the one that comes in Dad's bedroom and says, Dad, what are we going to do today? <coughs> Shane is the one that when Dad's outside working on the car, he's sitting right next to him, either to get in his way or hand him a tool. Shane is the one that when Dad gets ready to go fishing, he has to either push Shane out of the way to get in the front of the boat or either just absolutely let Shane have the boat by himself and he sits on the bank and watches him fish in the boat. Because Shane is just this kind of kid. He's all over the place. And he's all about what Dad is. And he's all about doing what Dad does. And he's all about loving his father. And he's all about honoring his father. 
And he's all about acknowledging his father. And Eddie is just absolutely beside himself with joy <coughs> about who Shane is. He knows, and he don't hold it against himself, that his other four has chosen the path that they've chosen. But Shane is walking in his dad's footsteps, and he knows it, and he's proud, and he loves him. And even though he wouldn't admit it, he loves him a little bit more than he does the rest of them because of the way he loves him back. Is that not true? Is it easier to love somebody a little bit more when they love you back? It is. Paul says we shouldn't do it, but it's true. Paul says we should love the ones who are not loved. As much as, if not more, than the ones that love us back. For what is there in giving if you expect something in return? But Eddie loved his son Shane. And then one day, as Shane had got up to some age, he was about 16 or 17, Dad had to put a set of brakes in front of his old truck. And Dad went out that Saturday morning, and Shane had a couple of friends of his that he had uh, met in school, and they were going to take off and go fishing that morning. Well, they took off and went fishing that morning. Dad went out there and was putting the brakes on his truck. And while he was putting brakes on his truck, he came in out and had to give it a bite to eat. While he was inside, the phone rang. And he answered it. And the policeman said, Mr. Shepard, this is such and such detective down at the such and such police force. Says, we got your boy down here. And Mr. Shepard says, which one of them is it, man? Because he knew. He was talking about one of the four. He said, Mr. Shepard, it's your son, Shane. We got him on shopping for charge. And Mr. Shepard says, no, you don't. You have one of my other ones. You don't have my boy, Shane. He says, Mr. Shepard, Shane told us that you weren't going to believe him. But he's down here. Him and his two friends. We caught him at the mall. We caught him in a dare. We call him the camera. <coughs> and he's admitted to it. He gets in his truck and he drives to the police office. And he walks in and there's Shane. There's his boy that he loves, that does no wrong, sitting there in the police office. In the police office. And he looks at him and he says, son, what have you done? He said, dad, I made a mistake. He said, they dared me to do it. And I've done it anyhow. Now I'm going to ask you something right now. And this comes from experience of what me and Becky heard this week. Will his daddy ever be able to look at him the same way again? Or did something happen to him during that time? I'm going to tell you that right now, this story comes from a situation that me and Becky have been not in but we definitely know the people that have been involved with it. And I know from the way that this man loved his son, that the relationship between this man and his son will never, ever be the same. His son devastated his father. His son has crushed his father. His son has abandoned his father's guidance. His son has walked away from what his father has taught him to be. His son has taken a step outside of his dad's footprints. And the dad said, I love him and I forgive him, but it will never be the son. And we sit here and we look at a situation like that. And there's a lot of us in here, honestly, that would tell you right quick, I mean, how many people in here trust their kid 100%? <laughs> Allison, this, you remember how many times you went, oh, in the sun's good glass? Oh, no. What if your mom would have held her hand up? What would you have done? Oh. <laughs> Allison, your mom did not hold her hand up. I didn't even see Marsha hold a hand up. Oh my God, I can see this! Daddy met her on his I distinctly remember seeing Mr. Roman not hold his hand. 
when she called me. She was hurt because of what that woman had said. And it hurt me. And the relationship never was the same again. I mean, can you relate to what I'm talking about? Have you had that happen? I want to talk about, I want to talk about something this morning. I want to turn to the very, very first of the Bible and look at Genesis. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about something that happened. We call it the fall. It's going to be in Genesis 3. Genesis 3. <clears throat> I'm going to read the first few verses for you. <coughs> but the verses we're going to be keying in on this morning is uh, verses 6 and 7. First of all, do we think Adam and Eve had any idea how good they had it? They had no idea, did they? They had no idea how good they had it. Imagine a perfect life with a perfect God. They loved you perfectly. Imagine that. You know what? We can't even imagine that because we we're so far from perfect. And we can't even imagine God is perfect because we can't understand perfection. We can't understand that. We've never had perfection in our lives about anything. We think we have, but we haven't. But let's read something. Let's see what it says. The heading of this is called the fall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but did God say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. But God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable, for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Folks, I want to talk to you about two things today. Two things today is, is, is something that I want, I want to share with you. Put yourself in any shepherd's position. Put yourself in any shepherd position. You've got four youngs that's just off the chain, but you've got that shame. You've got shame. You have devoted your life to him. You've loved him with more than your heart. You've loved him with your soul. You've loved him with your mind. You've loved him with your thoughts. You're dedicated to your child that you love so much. And you've done all this for your child. You have this relationship with this child. And all of a sudden, this child breaks the covenant of the relationship that you have with them by doing something completely wrong. Everybody always talks about what happened to Adam and Eve when they see them. We're going to talk about two of them right now. There's two things I want you to jot down, but we're not going to talk about right now. But two things happen to their eyes open and they realize something. But let me tell you something. Everybody always talks about what happened to Adam and Eve, about how they brought sin into the world. They talk about the serpent. Well, let me ask you something. What happened to God? What happened to God when they done what they done? How was he affected when they done what they done? What were some of the emotions that God felt when the perfect, the perfect children he had made turned it back on? You see, in the story about any shepherd, any shepherd is God. <clears throat> and shame is way more than that of me. Shame is us. Shame is every one of us sitting in here today. God was hurt. God was broken hearted. God was disappointed. God was, do you realize God was abandoned? Do you realize they abandoned God? when they've done what they've done. And notice I keep saying they. I don't blame it on the woman. I don't blame it on Adam. I blame it on they. Both of them have done it. Adam is actually the one that should accept the blame because he was the one that actually watched it happen. But let me tell you something else. Let me tell you something else that God has had before for mankind. 
Does anybody ever know, and has ever, anybody ever heard that God actually regretted making us? Does the Bible say anything about God ever just regretting making us? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. We're fixing to turn that right now. Turn it just over a couple of chapters to the book of Genesis 6. And we're going to read verse 7. Genesis 6, and we're going to look at verse 7. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I wrote down the wrong one, but it's still right. 6 and 7. I tell you, we're starting verse 5. Genesis 6, 5. And this is the flood. This is the long time of the flood. It says in verse 5, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that He had made human beings on the earth, and His heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, the creatures that moving on the ground. For I regret that I have made them. Do you realize how close we came to not even being here? You think about that. You think about the fact that God, God himself, said he was ready to make this. Well, let me explain something, folks. These people were no more defiled than what we are today. These people were no more sinful than what we are today. These people were no more separated from God than what we are today. So there's two things that got to take place. We're going to go right back down to Genesis 3. We're going to go to Genesis 3 and we're going to look at these verses. We're going to go back to verses 6 and 7. And we'll start with verse 6. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and for pleasing to the eye, I so desired. What is one of the biggest problems we have with our relationship with God today? We desire something other than God. That's what makes us have problems in our relationship with the Lord. It's we desire something else. He desires us. We desire something else. We desire relationships with others. We desire things. We desire money. We desire power. We desire positions. We desire, we desire our own flesh. We have desires for things in this world that we put ahead of God. Ain't that exactly what Eve just done? She looked at something and she saw it as a desire. That's exactly what she done. For gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. And then the two things I want to talk to you about is the eyes of those, both of them were open. And they realized they were naked. Okay, first of all, we'll talk about the eyes being open. Does it mean they were blind? Could they see before all this happened? They could. Sure they could. Sure they could. They could see. Their eyesight was as good as mine. Your shot. She saw which tree it was. It ain't like the snake grabbed her hand and brought her over there, which by the way, wasn't a snake when all this was going on. She could see she had eyesight. Is there such a thing as being able to see but not have vision? Yes. That's what she missed. She didn't have vision for God. I'm asking you today. Where's your vision for God? Where's your vision for God? What do you focus on? Are you focused on God daily? Do you walk with Him daily? Do you confide in Him daily? Do you confess to Him daily? Do you live with Him daily? What is your focus on? What is your vision for God? Do you have a vision for God? Do you have a vision for what God wants you to be? Because what happened just as soon as they ate the fruit, their eyes were open. I'm going to tell you something today, folks. At that point, they could see the difference between good and evil. Because it said before then that they couldn't because that tree was to give them the knowledge of what good and evil. So before then, they didn't have to have the knowledge of good and evil because all they knew was good. But let me tell you something, folks. Every one of us has done eat fruit. And every one of us need to open our eyes. And every one of us need to realize that because of who we are, we need a Savior. Period. And it ain't just us that needs it. It's everybody we ever come in contact with. But not only did their eyes become open to the sin in their life, they realized their nakedness. They realized the 
they were ashamed. Have you ever done something in your life that you was ashamed of? Have you ever done something in your life that you felt guilty for? Have you ever felt like, have you ever taken on the burden of guilt just, and, and just really just walk around with it for a little while? Let me tell you something, it's a mighty heavy burden to carry around. It's an awful, awful burden to carry around. And until you give it to the Lord, that burden will walk with you. It will weigh you down. It will push you down to you or push down to nothing. You will become nothing. And if you're becoming nothing, you cannot serve a holy God. But what about just simply being ashamed? Have you ever been ashamed of anything? Just outright being ashamed. I've had people in my life that I was ashamed of. I was, I've had people in my life I was ashamed to be around. I've had things in my life that I was ashamed to be part of. In a lot of ways, I'm ashamed of who I used to be. The people I used to hang with. The things I used to do. I'm very ashamed of some of the things I used to do. Very ashamed. You know what the sad part is? I'm ashamed of some of the things I've done since I've come to know the Lord. And anybody sits here that says they ain't done nothing they should be ashamed of after they come to know Jesus and tell them a lying church. Because we all have but the two things must take place. You have to realize the sin in your life by your eyes being open to it and the vision in the sin, seeing the sin, and then you have to understand that that sin is something you need to be ashamed of. And it's something you need to feel guilty of. Without Jesus, do you shouldn't carry around guilt. You better believe you should. And that's what that, that's what that moment in Adam and Eve's life was, was the fact that they were acknowledging their sin and that they were ashamed of their sin. And the whole time, where's God in all this? Devastating. It's devastating. He's hurt. He's to the point of regret. Why? Why did I even think that I could build something, create something, manifest something, love something? You know, if y'all would just sit back and wonder why God makes the begin with if he knew we was going to make such a mess of our relationship with him, I mean, wouldn't he have been better off just to buy the ferret? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Just I mean, You don't think so, Kim? Well, I had a ferret. <laughs> <laughs> you bought her a ferret? No. Her teacher gave it to her. Oh. Huh? You know that your mom didn't hold her hand up on her. I just want to make sure you knew. You know what he wanted? 
He wanted the relationship that you have with Him now. And I want to know are you living up to what God has done for you by the way you're living for Him? Is God not only just enjoying the relationship He has with you, are you actually doing something that can promote more relationships with Him? Because that's why we're here. We're here to tell others about Him. So let's move into a little bit of what, what God done. We got a few verses we're going to talk about. We're going to be in the book of Romans. We'll be in the book of Romans. We're going to go over a few verses this morning. Some great verses. Some great verses. Somebody tell me who wrote the book of Romans. Oh. Very good. Somebody tell me how many books are in the book of Romans. How many chapters in the book of Romans? <laughs> who? Sounds good. You know, all these things. It's just something I was asking while I put it. There are 16 books in the book. 16 chapters of Romans. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5. Stephen, that question I asked a while ago, what did God do? Did he, did he go on with something else? Uh, he did. He did. He, he gave us the ability. Now, I'm going to tell you all something about something that happened to me this morning. First of all, I, wow, Sunday school class this morning was was spot on. Golly, great. Sunday school class this morning was great. It really was. I'm going to tell you why. There were some questions asked this morning in Sunday school class, and I didn't exactly figure out. I, 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 you know what? Just great questions. Great questions. But there's going to be a sermon coming up for one of these days. Him pretty long, pretty quick. Him, if I live long enough, he lets me. And y'all can blame Billy Joe for it because he come up with a question this morning that I'm still dealing with how to answer it. And it's a wonderful question. But I'll tell you something. We were talking about something this morning in Sunday school class that went right along with what today's message is. And it's the fact of trust. Talk about trust. And one of the questions that was asked is what are some of the things in our life that we can do to regain trust in somebody else's life? What can we do? Well, first of all, can we do anything? Do you think God will ever trust a man? You think God would ever trust a man? No. You know why? Because he, he's on mission. He knows everything. And what are we going to do? We're going to make a mess of something. We're not going to spend the rest of our days there. As much as me and you want to be exactly who he wants us to be the rest of our days, we're going to fall short. We're going to fall short. Does he know that? Yes. Has he already put a plan in place that takes care of that? Yes. When did he put the plan in place? 2,000 years ago was when the plan was put in place. And he tells us about it in the book of Romans. See, a lot of times we don't get this deep in on salvation through Christ Jesus. But let's look at these verses. I'm going to read some verses to you. I'm starting in 5 and 11. And I'm going to read the first few words and then we're going to move right into what these verses say. It says, not only is this so, but we also boast, this is Paul talking, this is all, we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we now, notice the word now, received reconciliation. What does the word reconciliation mean? We be brought back together again. It means that somebody's got odds with another with one another. They they let go of the odds and they come back together and they can become friends again. They can become they can become uh, two people that love each other from the, from the heart again. <coughs> Not the emotions of love, but the actual love, reconciliation. So God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who have now received reconciliation, brought back to God through Christ. Verse ten. For if while we were God's enemies, we're coming back to that word. While we were God's enemies. We were reconciled to him through the death of the Son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So we've got two things going on here. We were reconciled to God through the death of Jesus. But what does it say about the life part? It says, through his life, we will be saved. This is very interesting how this verse says what it says. It almost talks as if salvation is a twofold thing. There's actually almost two events that take place. It's not, but if you read the verse and you look at it in a certain way, it almost, it almost looks like God had to accept the reconciliation before He saved us. Isn't that not interesting? That's very interesting the way it's put. For if while we were God's enemies, see, that's the problem with the world today. We were talking about a verse this morning in Sunday school class where a lot of people sometimes. They, they, they think that they, they do good. And if, if they're good, 
uh, there's no way that God can hold some uh, against somebody, some against somebody if they do good, and if they see the people that are doing good and they're enemies of God, it's confusing to Christians. How do they get things if they're enemies to God? How do they? How does this person get a job when he don't know Jesus, and this person don't get a job or loses their job if they if they do know Jesus? How, how do these things happen? You know what? It's not for us to know. It's not even for us to ask. It's for us to continue in the relationship we have with Him. It's not for us to stop. It's for us to keep going. Why? Because there's somebody down the road that needs to see what happened to us and see that God cares us through it. So that's when we need to stand up for Him most. When we're down is when we stand up for Him most. Okay? And we have to realize that without Christ, we are an enemy of God. An enemy. It doesn't mean that if you don't know Jesus, God's going to let you in because you're not a good person. It ain't happening like that. If you don't know Jesus, you're an enemy. Understand that. Therefore, in verse 12, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. You notice how it says one man? It doesn't say one woman. It says one man. Wow. A lot of people want to blame me. This says sin entered the world through one man. And death through sin... And this way, death came to all people because what? All sin. All sin. I don't know. Somebody, somebody may know a little bit more about the Mormon faith than I do. Can, can maybe can help me out with this. But one thing about the Mormon faith is they they don't think that they should be held accountable for Adam's sin. Okay, that's fine. If you don't want to be held accountable for Adam's sin, don't worry about Adam's sin. You don't stand enough in your own life. And that's the way each and every one of us should think about it. So if they say they're not to blame, they're saying that, that, that their God is loving and that they're not going to be held accountable about what the Bible says about sin because it's somebody that happened a long time ago. It's not, it don't apply to us. Don't worry about that. This says it all in sin. Do we have another verse that says something like this? Chuck, sure. it's right on top of your head. What does Romans 3.23 say? I love it. I love it like this. Chuck, somebody please head Chuck out. Somebody head Chuck for all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Chuck, that's going to be one of your memory verses. One of your memory verses. Stephanie, you should have kept him right now. All the nice things you said about him in Sunday school class, and you couldn't even have your husband when he was in despair. That's terrible. He's a blessing, but you're going to leave him hanging. <laughs> Is accepted, then the sin is taken away. 
That's the only way it's going to work. Moving down a couple of verses, verse 16. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin, saying that his gift of love, his gift of grace, uh, is more powerful than one man's sin. The judgment, listen to this, it's so interesting. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. That's how strong and powerful his love and grace is for us. Once sin was here, his grace and his love was able to take care of it. Because everybody has sinned, but he can take care of everybody. Verse 17, for if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. Verse 18, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification for life in all people. See, it's just, it's, it's so just, there, there's bookends, people. There's bookends to all this. Think about it. When we talk about bookends, what do we talk about? We talk about the beginning of something. We talk about the ending of something. Notice what the bookends is in this whole thing about sin and salvation. Through one act, on one end, started sin. Sin flourished. Sin run rapid. Sin was in everybody, in every day. Everything was sin. Man was sin because of one act that brought sin into the world. And here we are in the middle. Okay? Adam brought it in. Everybody else is doing it. But from one act of Jesus, it was taken care of. So you got bookings. You got one act deserving condemnation. Another act it taken, has taken care of all of us. But if you don't believe in that second act, if you don't believe in that last Bible, I mean that last book in, you're still in the life pattern. You're still in the sin. Still in the sin. Alright, moving on. Verse 19. But just as through disobedience of the one man that many were made sinners, also the obedience of one man made the many be made righteous. Diane asked a question this morning about blessings. How we to, how we to receive blessings? And there's never been no more of an obedient act in this world than Christ dying on the cross for His Father for us. That is the ultimate act of obedience. You know what Jesus' blessing is for that? You know what Jesus' blessing is for that act of obedience? The ones that He will spend eternity with that accept Him for it. And the sad part about it is He died for the ones that won't accept Him. And that's awful. But you know what? There will be joy in heaven in the relationship that we will have with our Savior. And His blessing came from His obedient act on the cross. And He will forever and eternally be blessed for it. And you know what? We will too if we accept it. Let's make sure we accept our Savior and His obedient act today. Let us pray. Paul, we come to you now. Thank you for this time.